So good evening, everyone. I want to thank everybody for being here this evening and giving me a chance to talk to you again. I want to welcome our visitors, of course. You're always welcome here anytime. Tonight, I want to look at part two of what we looked at a few weeks ago. How do I know I am still in Christ? Sometimes we have doubts. You know, sometimes maybe we're going along in our life for a period of time and then we just kind of kind of realize something doesn't feel right. Maybe we just are just having an off time. But uh, we we ask ourselves, we wonder, am I am I still following Christ? Am I in the faith? Am I doing the correct things? Now, this is the second part, like I said, from a couple of weeks ago. And this is going to be all in First John, if you want to follow along. It's going to be mainly chapters 3, 4, and 5, though I am going to start here with a couple of verses from chapter 2, toward the end of chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. The Lord, through John, does not want us deceived. In Christ we have received the Holy Spirit, that's the anointing that's being referred to, and the Spirit teaches us through the Word. And he teaches us what is true so that we can distinguish between the truth and a lie or falsehood. So if we abide in his teachings and what we have learned from the Bible and follow those things we know that are true, then we are in Christ. So the test is, are we being deceived or are we staying true to what we know? We may not know everything and that's okay, but we should be following what we know, what we have learned, and avoid what we know is false. What is That is all a part of being in Christ. And that leads us to this test of purification. In chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, purification, or you can think of this as sanctification, in this sense is just to remove the sin from our lives. If we are in Christ, our goal is to be more like Jesus, to be more like him, to be holy and pure as he is, and to be like that with him in eternity. Because of that, we will begin to purify ourselves now in this life. We can't wait until the judgment because that's too late. So the test here, are we removing sin as we learn about it? When we find out something is wrong, are we changing to follow what is right, to follow the Lord? As we grow in our walk with Jesus, we should be removing those things from our old life. The sinful wrong things, we can't keep carrying that baggage with us. It's not going to go into heaven with us. We should be learning to let go of our sin as we follow the Lord, purifying ourselves to be more like Jesus. And this is walking in the light, which we also talked about in that last lesson, practicing to be more like the Lord in our lives. We must be doing this if we are in Christ. And then if you look at our next test, which is kind of like part two of this, it is the test of growth. If we look at verses 4 through 9, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. 
Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Pardon me. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. These verses hearken back to what we talked about in the, the other lesson as well. Earlier in the letter, John is talking about purposefully choosing sin and not purifying ourselves. Uh, if you look at verse 6, the tense here in this uh, is that that same tense that conveys a continual practice. Uh, like you would say, whoever abides in him does not practice sin, does not keep sinning. Whoever does keep sinning has neither seen him or known him because they're continually choosing sin. It's not accidental sin. It's purposeful. So it's that type of idea there. And the key to that, too, if you look in verse 7 for us, are we purposefully choosing to practice righteousness? That's kind of um, it's kind of a comparison between those two things in a way. So he says, "Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, being the Lord, is righteous." And that is the test. If we practice righteousness, then we will grow in righteousness. Now, verse 8 goes back to the idea of he who continually chooses to sin is of the devil. Because the devil always sinned, and Jesus came to destroy the sin. He came to destroy that from Satan, to destroy the sin in our lives. So, do not be deceived. You will know if others are righteous by what they practice, by that, that fruit that you see. Now, verse 9 is not to be taken literally as we read it in English. Again, it goes back to that same idea. But the idea here in verse 9 is that we are growing and should be growing that seed, God's word in us, that seed of righteousness that we get from the Lord. As we are growing more like Jesus, the more we practice righteousness. And remember that the Lord's blood continually covers us and washes us clean when we fall short. That's not a license for sin, but it is available to us and it is there for us to help us on those times where we do err or fall short. So the specific test here is, are you growing in righteousness? Are you growing that seed? Are you in the Bible feeding that seed of faith and righteousness that God has given us? We should be growing if we're in Christ. And then these verses lead us to the next test, which is the test of fathers in verses 10 through 15. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So are we a child of God or of Satan? Are we practicing righteousness and love as we've been taught from the Bible? Or are we acting like Cain? Are we envious and covetous and hating? Again, we must not hate others. That is not the way to righteousness or of righteousness. And do not be surprised if the world hates us like Cain hated 
Abel. Do we love our brother even if they hate us? That's a hard test. But um, we must do that. Um, if we hate, we are equivalent to a murderer. And we know that Jesus talked about this even back in the Gospels and the Sermon on the Mount. And so the test here is which father do we choose to act like? Our Heavenly Father, the God of love, or do we choose to act like Satan, the father of lies? And then that leads us right into our next test, which is do we have the works or deeds, I use the word deeds, of love? Because some people get hung up over works. So I was thinking of trying to avoid it. I'm probably still going to use the word works, though. That's just the way it is. But the idea is we should have these deeds of love in our life. So if we look at chapter 3, verses 16 through 24, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children... Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So just like when James says, without works, faith is dead, because faith requires some kind of action. The same is true for love. Without deeds, without action, love is not love at all. Love that does not help others or does, do, does not do anything is a lie. If you remember the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, which I'm not going to go there, but... We will be judged by our deeds. Now, we also mentioned in class this morning, we'll be judged by what we say, but here we're focusing on our deeds. We will be judged by our deeds, whether we have those actions or not. God's love is a decision to do good for others. It's not just an emotion or something of that nature. It is a decision to do good for others. And we can't just talk a good game and say that we love others and never act on it. So these good deeds, these I'm thinking of these as like the fruits of salvation because we've been talking about trees and fruits a lot. So that's just the way I'm, I'm looking at it now is just these are the fruits of salvation and they, they prove that we are of God, that we stand for him. And notice what John says here about our hearts. If we look in verses uh, 20 and 21, what John says here, if we, if we do miss it, if we do fall short, sometimes I've missed opportunities to do something good for someone or to help someone, and I regretted that and I felt bad about that, and that's what this reminded me of. I felt bad in my heart for that. So if our heart condemns us because... We missed it because we fell short. God sees more than just this one time where we missed it. He sees everything. He sees all things, knows all things. So he sees all those times we don't miss it. He sees all those times where we do the right thing. We respond correctly. And he's not quick to condemn us for the times we miss it. And we can repent and learn to do better. Because remember, we are practicing to get better. We are practicing following the Lord to improve and to get better. 
Now, also, if we responded and did what we could to help someone, or if someone was in a position where we could not help them at all for whatever reason, and our conscience is clear, then neither does God hold that against us. Then looking at uh, verse 22, we can't expect God to honor our prayers if we do not obey and honor him. But if we are not selfish and we're doing these things that please God, then God honors our prayers because we're asking for things that are in his will and we're not just praying for ourselves, asking for selfish things, material things, money, those types of things. By loving others indeed in doing these things um, and not just giving lip service, we can know that we are in Christ and that his spirit is in us, that we're abiding in him, which we're going to talk more about abiding, but it does come up here. So I do want to mention that. And through these fruits of salvation, these these good works um, done in done in love, remember that we do not work to be saved, but that our salvation does and must produce works of love. So I kind of jumbled that up a little bit, but we don't work to be saved, but our salvation should produce these works of love, these good deeds. So next we'll look at the test of listening. And this is in John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, he who knows God hears us, he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now again, God does not want us to be deceived, and that's a part of John's theme in this letter. We need to test the spirits. We need to listen closely to what's being taught or preached and make sure that it agrees with the word of God. And when we look at people who are teaching or preaching, do they confess that Jesus came as that divine, holy son of God in the flesh. Now for them, they had a specific issue where they had people denying that Jesus came in the flesh. But, and, and there may be people that still do that today. I'm not saying it couldn't be. But for us, I think we need to look at it in a, in a manner that if anyone is in any way making Jesus out to be less than what he was, that divine, holy Son of God, God in the flesh, then they are false. They are wrong. They may be wildly misguided, but either way, they are wrong. If they at least confess this, as John is saying, like if they are saying that Jesus is in the, came in the flesh, then uh, they are basically saying that he is the Messiah, and that would also at least infer that they believe in the death and the resurrection from what John is saying here. Otherwise, they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah at all. But for us, we just want to make sure that no one is lessening Jesus in any way, because if they are, they're wrong. False prophets will also speak of worldly things, which John mentions, uh, material goods and wealth, those types of things. And people pursuing those things will listen to them, will follow them. So we must listen closely again and see the difference in these worldly pursuits and the spiritual, moral pursuits of God. By listening closely, testing what is said against the Word of God, we should know the difference in truth and error. And there's 
two literal tests here. Uh, the first one being the person that confesses Jesus came in the flesh as the Holy Son of God. So that's like one test. And then there's a second test here at the end. Do they listen to, John says it as, they do not hear us. They hear us or do not hear us, right? He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. And so are they accepting the teachings of, of the apostles in the epistles here in the New Testament. Do they listen to those teachings? Do they follow those? Or do they dismiss them? So I was thinking of this as of accepting the teachings of like Paul and John and Peter and Jude and all of these epistles. Do we accept those? If people do not accept those because they are coming from the apostles who Jesus sent, then um, they are false. The epistles are here to <laughs> clarify Jesus' teaching to us, to help us understand they're not to contradict or overwrite his teaching. So we need to understand those things. So stay in God's word, be knowledgeable, test what we are hearing against what the Bible says. And if we listen like this, we can know that we're still on track and we're still in Christ. So if we look at another test following this, the test of loving one another, verses 7 through 11, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. <coughs> so see what the test is. It's not just to love like we love our spouse, but it's a call to love one another, to make that decision to love one another. This is just like in John's gospel that last night that Jesus was with the apostles and he stressed this love one another so many times. I counted one time, I've forgotten how many, but so many times he tells them love one another. He stressed that over and over and John obviously did not forget. And this is a reciprocal love in the family of God where we we all, we love and care about one another. We should all love one another. This is what, uh, well, this is that godly love where we want what is good for each other. We want what is better for each other. And we are willing to sacrifice of ourselves to help the other person get what is better for them, to help them. Now, if we, and where we also, we value each other. We value others, each other, more than ourselves. Now, if you notice verse 8, verse 8 is kind of scary if you think about it. If we do not love like this, like, like has been described to us, if we do not love like this, we do not know God. And if we do not know God, we are not in Christ. So that verse in itself is scary. It's important that we understand that. So that godly sacrificial love, though, that's how the Father loves us. He sent Jesus because of that love. Jesus, that's how he loves us. He went and died on the cross for us because he loves us. For our betterment, for our benefit, it was not really for his benefit. Now, we may never equal that example, but we should imitate that as best we can. And remember that that's how Jesus loved us. So do we have this love for one another? That is the test here to see if we are in Christ. And this love also proves that we are abiding in him, as we mentioned before. And here in these verses, abiding and confession are kind of intermingled. So I kept these together. Verses 12 through 16 in chapter 4. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, 
and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So if we love one another, we know we are in Christ, and that his spirit abides in us. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit, sometimes referred to as Christ spirit, uh, spirit of God. However we say that, that's the Holy Spirit. Um, because God's spirit is in us and we are in the Lord, then we confess that Jesus is the Savior that God sent for us. And this is not just a one-time thing where we confess that and then we're baptized and then maybe we never talk about it again. This is a continual confession in our lives with our words and with our actions both. We proclaim and preach Jesus throughout our lives declaring his salvation. And of course, that flows from the love we were talking about, because if we love others, we're going to want to proclaim Jesus and confess Jesus to them so that they will know, because we will want them saved. So are we confessing and proclaiming Christ? And this leads to the next test, which is the test of loving God. And this is in verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Can we love God and not love the people he's created? No, we can't. These verses basically just say that's that's not possible. Uh, if we love our Savior, if we're in Christ, we will also love everyone else. We will want them to be saved just as God wants them to be saved. To be in Christ is to be his servant and to work for him. And can we say we love people and not tell them about Jesus? Can we say we love others and not help them? No, we must care about the people that we see around us, that we are in contact with, and we must share Jesus with them. He is their, he's their only hope. He's the only salvation any of us have. Otherwise, if we're not sharing the Lord with them, we do not love them. And if we don't tell them about Jesus, then for all practical purposes, we kind of hate them because we don't care enough about them to uh, share salvation with them. We don't care if they go to hell. And that's not a good thing. That's a bad condition of our heart if we're in that, in that way. To be in Christ is to love everyone and want them to be saved. And this doesn't mean we're going to like everything they say and do. It doesn't mean we're going to agree with all the worldly ideas or anything like that. It just means we're going to look past all that stuff. We're going to look past all of that and look at their soul and value their soul the way God values their soul. Realize that they are precious, precious to God, even in whatever awful state they may be in. They are precious to God. So the next test is simple, and it kind of flows again, flows through all of this. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it's the test of obedience. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Pardon me. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, 
our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So God shows us his love through forgiveness and salvation in Jesus, through sending his Son. And if we are in Christ, we show our love for the Lord and for the Father through obedience. Notice John starts here in verse 1 with faith, whoever believes. And then he goes to everyone who loves. And when we love Jesus, we keep his commandments. We obey because we want to out of love. And that's a big test of our heart. And it also shows where we are in salvation and in our walk with the Lord that we want to keep the Lord's commandments because we love him. Not that we're perfect, but we're trying. Again, we're practicing. We're always practicing. We're trying to follow Jesus' perfect example. We love God. We love one another. And we love our neighbor. So then how do we know we love one another? Because we love God and keep his commandments. Our obedience shows our love and it builds our love. This godly love inside of us that God gives us that we follow. We're practicing God's love so that we can love more and so that we can love more perfectly like the Lord does. Because that loving faith, that's what overcomes the world. To be in Christ is to be obedient in love. And that faith, it gives us this testimony and witness to share that we see here in cha uh, still chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So in faith, we have this testimony. God has given us eternal life. He's given us this great gift that we do not deserve. In Christ, we have this assurance of eternal life. And this eternal life is only in Jesus, God's Son. Nowhere else. And that is our testimony that we should be sharing. We need to be sharing that testimony. If we do not share this, our belief in Jesus, then we are in essence saying that we do not believe. Because belief, faith, requires action. So inaction just simply says you do not believe. Now, if we look at verse 12, we either believe and have Christ and eternal life, or we don't believe, and we don't have either one. Again, kind of, a, kind of a scary statement, but true. So our testimony to the world, to all those lost souls, is that God has given us eternal life, but that life is only found in Jesus, in Christ. If you are in Christ, you must have this testimony that God gives eternal life through Jesus and no other. Anyone who does not have Jesus does not have eternal life. So all the folks who are saying, you know, there's many paths to God and all these things, that's not true. It's never been true and it's not going to be true anytime in the future. So anyone who does not have Jesus does not have eternal life. Now, in closing, let's look at John's final reason for, for writing this letter. And it's in chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Similar to his gospel, John has given us the reason, the real big reason for writing this letter at the end. So, the two big reasons here are so that we will know we have salvation because we can go through this, self-examine, 
go look at our, you know, test ourselves so that we will know we have salvation and so that we will continue to believe in Jesus because he's stressing again that Jesus is the way, the only way. So this is so we will continue in the faith. And this was John's purpose inspired by God. He knew that we would need these examinations, these tests, that we would need the encouragements and lessons that are in this letter. So this evening, do you need any encouragement this evening? Is there anything we could assist you with or do for you? If anyone does have any need this evening, if there's something we could help you with, just let us know as we stand and sing.